Hey, welcome to this episode of Meet the Gaffer, and you're going to meet the crane guy. When I first started in the industry as a jib operator, what's the pinnacle? We all think the pinnacle is working on a, on a feature, feature film. And so that's what I was always striving for. I wanted to work on a feature. That was like what I wanted to do. Well, my Pegasus allowed me to do that. My very first movie was Patch Adams with Robin Williams. Uh, it was a local thing, and that's the reason why I got it, because I'm a local company and vendor. Um, when I first got to that set, I was a little overwhelmed. It was bigger than anything I had been on at the time. Um, I was working with people that I didn't know because the crew had all come up from Los Angeles, um, or the, at least the, the crew that I was working with. And it was a little overwhelming. Um, but I was still excited and, and really happy to be on it. Um, did some other movies in between uh, with the Pegasus. Um, and I realized that um, movies are great. It's fun. There's always a there's always a bigger budget um, than some of the other things I do. But I realized that the structure is still the same. You have all your departments are the same. They're, they're bigger, but all your departments are the same. Um, and the control is completely different. There's, there's a whole other, you know, there's, there's a huge production company behind it. And above them is the producing company. And whether it be 20th Century Fox or Paramount Pictures or whoever, and then you have the production company under that, and you're just a vendor at some point. But on top of being a vendor, because I because I own the company, I'm also the technician because I come out with the gear. It's a whole different level of stuff. Um, it's not that I don't enjoy features; I still enjoy them. It's still always fun to go out and with my techno crane. Normally, I'm not on a feature very long. I come out and I day play um, because locally, there's not enough work to keep a techno crane on hold on the picture for the whole run of the show. I'd love one of those, um, but I don't. So I go out and I day play. Um, it's weird, I come out, I drive up, everybody's been on and they all know each other and they're hanging out and the crane comes out and we do the crane shot and I, I kind of pack it up and go home and I'm no longer a part of that shoot. I'm glad I have the opportunity to go from working on a small corporate job with my Jimmy Jib and flying around with a small crew and having fun doing that and doing cool stuff because I'm allowed to, and have the opportunity also to work on bigger commercial and feature productions where I go out and, and I'm kind of working on someone else's uh, process. Um, I couldn't do either all the time. And because I have the different, different cranes that can do different things, luckily I'm able to do different things all the time. And I, I prefer it that way. As, as jib operators, we offer up what we think is cool. I've been on jobs where they're like, that's awesome. We never thought of that. Yeah, do that. That's cool. The whole wrap around thing. And, and there are some jobs where I go on and I may offer something up and it's not accepted at all. It's like, no, we just want to do a little. And you know what? As jib operators, that's what we're there for. Sometimes I go out and we take our jib and we build it out to 30 feet and we stick it up as high as it'll go and we put extra weight on it to lock it off and they take the shot. And after the shot, they come over and go, look, I know that really wasn't what you want to do and this and that. I'm like, you know what? If you guys are happy and that's what your storyboard called for, then I'm happy to be here for you. And I'm glad you were able to do that. And that's what you have to be able to do. It's not our job. It's not our shoot. It's ultimately not our project that they're going to release. But as operators, and, and we, we like to do cool stuff as jib operators, it's our job to offer it up but it's their call whether they want to do it or not. And you have to be okay with it. I have a weird blend of managing camera department and grip world, especially if I go out with my Pegasus and I have a remote head. So sometimes I'll go out as the remote head tech and then I specifically deal with camera even though I help build the crane. And then sometimes I go out with just the crane and I'm, I'm the crane tech and work with the grips directly and rarely talk to the camera department. On the Jimmy Jib, I kind of have to talk to the grips that kind of know where the jib is going on a commercial. The crane's going to go here, we're going to do this with it. And then I have to work with camera department to say, okay, what camera package are we using? Power running up, what am, I have four pin, three pin, what do you need? What camera package? What's the power options? Um, are you using your own remote? Am I supplying remotes? I have wireless remotes as well. But if, if they have their camera package already built, I need a sliding base plate from them, so I have to work with them directly as well. So it's a, it's a high hybrid, especially for jib operators, and, 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 and we all know this as jib operators, that we have to deal with the, the, the grip side and the camera side. And then above all of them, 
we have to work directly with the DP and the director um, because they're the ones who tell all the other guys how they're going to do the shot. And so there's really this entire chain of, of people as a jib operator or even a crane operator sometimes that we have to deal with and, and, and manage that, that relationship with them on set. I have to interact with usually the grip department uh, when I go out with my bigger cranes and even with the jimmy jibs. Um, so that interaction is something that um, you have to learn. Uh, they are truly in charge of that set. I'm in charge of the crane in making sure that it's operated safely, but they're in charge of the set. Um, when I get there, especially in a commercial, there's usually a storyboard that says, you know, crane goes here and ends up here. So when I get there, the grips usually help me. And luckily, again, it's a small market. San Francisco is a very tight-knit group. Um, and even when productions come up from Los Angeles, I, I work with the grip departments, and, and everybody's really pretty cool about working with a crane tech. It, it, it's now an industry standard where a crane tech comes out with the crane. So I get to location. Um, they say, hey, the crane's going to go over there. Uh, we're going to do a shot where the person's walking down a trail, and we come down and we meet them as they approach camera. So all I'm in charge of at that point as a crane tech is getting the, everything assembled properly, making sure the crane is safe and operating smoothly for the operator to operate. Uh, sometimes I swing the crane, I'm actually operating the crane, and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I just babysit my crane. I go on set, I make sure it's built properly because there are some pieces that have to go on properly, otherwise the crane fails and you don't want that. It's kind of career limiting. And so I just make sure that the crane is safe and the grips kind of take over and when they're done, I keep a grip and we put the crane back in the trailer and I drive away and send an invoice. In any crane, there are kind of three sections. You have the pivot, you have the front end and the back end, um, referred to in different terminologies between different people. Um, I always call it the pivot. Uh, some people uh, refer to the back end as the tail or the weight bucket side, and the front end is the front end. And so every crane has those three basic parts. You have your pivot, front, back, or tail. Counterbalance, pivot, uh, it's just like the other crane. You have a pivot section. Um, unlike the other cranes, you do have a front end and a back end, but this is all one piece. You have a main section here, which is the biggest box, and all the other sections slide into it. So you don't really build the crane. The crane is built. We talked about the weight sled. This is the sled. This is what transfers the weight all the way back and forward on the return. It's driven by a belt. The belt is driven by a motor. Inside the motor is another drum wheel, and on that drum wheel are all the cables that pull the arm or push the arm out. And um, after a certain length, um, and certain cranes have different pieces, but there's always some sort of strut system. It's just like on a bridge. You can't build a big bridge and expect it not to crumble. It has to be held up by some sort of a strut system. On the bridges around here, Bay Bridge, Golden Gate, they have their struts. Big towers, struts come down to another big tower and hold that bridge. The struts become side struts and top struts at a certain length. This is built out to 18 foot. It'll do 40 feet. So cranes all have strut systems. My Pegasus has what they call anchor poles. Um, there's always some sort of leveling mechanism for the, for the head section of the crane. Um, some of it may be a balance rod, like my Pegasus. There's a balance rod that runs from the weight bucket through the pivot all the way to the front. So no matter where the crane is, the, the platform where you mount the remote head is always level. So that is done by a leveling rod. On the Jimmy Jibs, they do it in various different ways. There's a pulley system. Uh, on the older cranes, it was a double pulley that wrapped all the way around from the pivot to the front end. And as you raise the crane, it would keep the head level. On the newer Jimmy Jibs, they do a single pulley, which is strapped to the, the pivot again and runs all the way to the front of the head. It's gravity fed. Again, single pulley for the pulley system. So as, you, as I'm raising the crane, you can see that this is level. If there was nothing to keep this level, as you raise the head, the head would droop underneath. And so that pulley cable keeps it all level. So you can go in any direction on the arm and the head will stay level. So the only thing keeping that tight is the weight of the camera. Um, on the cam mates, which is a, a different version of a, of a, of a jib, 
um, they do a, a leveling rod that goes all the way from, again, from the, from the pivot all the way to the front of the crane. Um, and it's not gravity fed, it's not a pulley cable, it's a, it's a hard rod. So different cranes will have different systems for leveling um, the camera platform, but they're all the basic parts are the same. You have the base, pivot, front end, back end. Back end has the weight bucket, front end has the remote head. As part of the cranes, uh, no crane can really function nowadays without a remote head. Um, the remote operated from a distance away from the top of the crane. Um, you used to be, and you still can, ride a crane, and the operators would sit where, and everybody's seen those production stills where the guys are on the crane and you got two of them sitting in seats and there's the camera package in the middle. I still offer that, most people don't anymore, but um, they've been replaced with remote heads. So there's, there's different types of remote heads. There's non-stabilized and stabilized. Um, multiple companies make stabilized heads, multiple companies make non-stabilized heads. Um, the stabilized heads are super, super expensive and really, really cool. And the non-stabilized heads are basically remote pan and tilt units. Um, you can get third axis as well, but um, most of them are just pan and tilt. So a lot of my jobs call for a stabilized head. I can't afford to buy a stabilized head. So those have to come from a sub rental in Los Angeles. There are plenty of companies that that's what they have. They have multiple um, gyro stabilized heads. And so they come up with a technician and they put them on my crane. And there are plenty of jobs that I do with my bigger cranes that my non-stabilized head will do. And so I supply that as well. My, my version happens to be, I upgraded from uh, my original remote head, which was a power pod, to what is now basically uh, the new power pod. It's a pan and tilt unit, super strong. It's a Moses Lambda. It's a Lambda head made by Cartoni, but it's been motorized by a company called Moses. Um, and then on the Jimmy Jibs, they have their own remote heads. And they're just simple, gear-driven, pan and tilt units. That's, that's all they are. They're very simple. As soon as you weight the camera properly to a zero gravity point, those motors will, will turn that camera like no problem. So again, you have pan, you have tilt, and now that you've in, involved a third axis, your third axis is your Dutch. That's your roll system. So a lot of people think that when you look straight down and you want to do a circle, you need a third axis, but you don't. When you look straight down, pan is now roll. You're turning in a circle with your pan motor. This has nothing to do with it anymore. So often I have to tell people that when they ask for a third axis and I ask why and they say, well, we're pointing straight down and we want to be able to rotate. I have to tell them that when you rotate looking straight down, it's pan. This doesn't rotate what they call nodally. In other words, if you want to spin on a circle in a direct, that's nodal. This one has a little bit of an egg shape. So what will happen is you rotate in a circle, it'll do this. It won't spin on that little dot. These don't do nodal. They have a little bit of an egg shape to them. On, my, on the bigger remote heads, on my Lambda, when you put the spin axis on, it will do nodal. You can put a camera right in the middle of that spin axis and spin it as many times as you want and there's no egg shape. It's right nodal. And a lot of jobs, when you look straight down, if you want to be nodal, then you have to use your spin axis. I did a commercial where there were a bunch of dancers below, and they wanted to come right down on the middle of the dancers. So while they were rotating, the techno crane was retracting so that we could keep that line, because the higher up we were, we retracted, and he spun nodally on that. You couldn't do that without the spin axis. But this mo mostly is used for looking straight ahead and just dutching the the frame. And again, not used that often anymore, but it's just another attachment that I have. And so remote heads are also a, a, an industry, are also an aspect of my industry that I had to get into. Remote heads are operated in, in different ways. There's wheel ba wheels based systems, um, pan bar systems, which are basically um, the remote head is attached to a tripod in a very easy term. And, and when you move the tripod, tilt, and pan, it corresponds to the remote head. Uh, some have joysticks, some are joystick-based. 
All of the Jimmy Jib heads are joystick based. Um, you can buy a wheels based system for it. They were made by Jimmy Jib. I, I didn't find that they were um, accurate enough to tell a person that I had wheels for my Jimmy Jibs, so I never purchased them. Um, but the big remote heads that I have all are wheels based systems, um, pan and tilt. Um, there's also another wheel just like this that lives here and that you access the spin axis, which is controlled by a, another operator. That's a skill that I've learned over the years are, are how to do wheels. I enjoy it, it's fun, it's super accurate, it's challenging, I, I actually really enjoy it. But the jibs um, with their joystick based systems for a single operator, by far the best. The crane technician is always in charge of the crane. No matter how well the grips know the crane, crane technician is always in charge. So we know what piece goes from the trailer to the crane, in what order, and how it's built. Um, most, most crane, uh, most grips um, will put together the Fisher 23, which is a dolly-based crane arm, jib arm. Um, and it's got a huge um, uh, sheet on how to put it together. It's kind of interesting to watch them put it together sometimes because there's a lot of parts and pieces and if you don't put it together a lot, it can be interesting to try to put that puzzle together. But on a, on a, on a Pegasus, on my Pegasus, and same with the Phoenix or the Aero Crane, there, there, there is a way of putting it all together. And so grips help us by um, just, just physically helping us. We tell them what parts go next, they help us assemble it in that order, always build a crane from the pivot out and then add the back end and when you tear it down you always tear it down from the back to the front because if you put the back end on first the crane would lift up so it's always front to back when you build and back to front when you tear down and so grips help us when we go on set by just aiding in the building of the crane safely techno crane balance is completely different than the other cranes because the weights and the arm move you have a balancing point when the crane is retracted and you have a balancing point when the crane is fully extended. And it has to do with putting more or less weights on the carriage that moves or adding some slider weights or adjusting the slider weights at the front of the crane. Again, balancing is different. You have, we're in retracted mode, so you have this balance. Here's your slider weights that we talked about. They live on the handles. If I took one off, it would want to float. Then, here's the cool part about the Techno operated by this, what we call a pickle, or a joystick, depending. Um, what happens is the weights will transfer back as the arm comes out. So you see the belt, belt's moving, motor's turning, belt's moving, weights are sliding back to us, and then you have your balance on the back. We'll bring it back in. So you stand where you want, I'll come to you. And if you trust me, there you go, your transfer happens. So working with cranes all the time, safety is a big issue. Um, obviously the first thing to do is you have to build the crane properly. If the crane is not built properly, you increase your risk of accidents happening. So the footing of your crane is important. If it's not level, it needs to be level. So there are issues with making that platform that you're, that you're on level and stable. Um, after that, making sure the camera is safetyed onto its platform. All of my jibs have safety cables. I've seen guys, and not the, the good jib operators, all the good jib operators will do this. They're safety cables. If that camera pops off of that plate, there is nothing to stop it from hitting the audience or the actor, or smashing to the ground. So a safety cable on the platform, pure and simple. It's easy, but if you forget it, it's, it's a high risk. Um, the techno crane, people constantly crossing underneath it thinking that they're safe when they have no concept that the crane can retract and clip you on the way through. So just being aware of your surroundings and knowing that people, usually on the bigger sets, an AD will stop that from happening. And there's a lot of times where I'll have to go to the AD and say, look, there's too many people crossing underneath the crane, they're crossing behind, they're crossing. I have people cross between me operating the jib and the pivot. That's only six feet and they try to duck under while I'm operating. Um, so safety is a huge issue. 
Um, because I have increased my liability because of the bigger cranes, a certificate of insurance from the production company is something that is issued to me now. Uh, that contract negotiations that have to happen that I never thought I would have to do. I have these huge legal teams from, from big motion picture <laughs> companies sending me letters and I don't have a legal team so I have to really go through those things. Um, luckily I have some mentors in that area as well that, that help me out but safety is a huge issue with a crane. Safety is a huge issue on set. Um, and so with a crane, for me, especially being the owner of those cranes, it's, it's a big issue and always has to be in the forefront of my thought. So owning a company, and, and there are plenty of guys, like I said, I'm a small fish, big pond. There are plenty of guys that own multiple cranes like I do and do multiple venues from concerts to feature films. Um, Los Angeles has a, a bunch of guys like me, and they do way bigger stuff than me. Um, we as operators are all the same. We operate... We own and operate a crane company. Um, so for us, it's important to, ultimately, my responsibility is to make my client happy. That's my ultimate responsibility. Um, and, and to be a good operator. But um, part of being a good businessman as a Jimmy Jib operator is carrying the things that are gonna make it easy for ACs. ACs call or refer me to a job and the producer says, hey, I'm gonna have the AC call you so that you can prep the package together. Normally, local ACs, they'll call and go, hey, I know it's you, everything's good. Because, um, and again, this happened over the years. I've been doing this for 27 years now. You, you buy things that make that package complete, right? So as a beginning jib operator, you're probably not gonna have this stuff, right? So power cables, three pin, four pin, multiple extension lengths, um, follow focus units, um, sliding base plates, uh, adapters for different cameras, um, adapters for your, your focus motors, different focus motors, backup motors, backup cables. And the only way you know about this stuff is you, I went out on a job and I ripped a cable out of the controller and I didn't have a backup. Well, how stupid is that? Guess what? I've never operated without backup cables now. Every cable has a backup. Um, there are things I don't have backups of. Um, on my Technocrane, I don't carry a backup telescoping box. Luckily, that hasn't gone down yet, and, and I can get something shipped overnight if that happens. But as a jib operator, you, you, and as a crane owner operator too, you want to make it transparent to your client that, that there are no, that you don't want any problems. So by me supplying all of those things and, and having that in my, somebody forgets something, I run to my truck and I go, oh, I got it, we can make it work with this. Um, I was on a job recently where we had specifically ordered um, uh, iris rods to attach, attach my motors to. This was for a, a broadcast um, show, and they realized that they didn't bring any. Well, I said, you know what? I think I might have some in my bag. I ran to my truck, had it in the bag, and put it in. Otherwise, it would have had to been shipped or, or ordered locally, and it would have put us behind. So just little things like that. And again, that, that has to go with more of being a businessman and making sure that your clients are happy as opposed to being a good jib operator. There are plenty of people, plenty of, of people that are jib operators. Um, they freelance as jib operators. They go out and operate someone else's jib. Um, I offer that as a service as well. If you want to rent a jib from me, you can and go out and I, I try to run you through a little bit of the technical aspect of the jib, but you can go out and be a jib operator with, with one of my jibs. When I bought my first jib, it was really for me to use as a tool um, and I thought it was cool and I liked putting it together and I liked operating it and it is it's 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 a cool tool but it led into a business um, and there are a lot of things in the business aspect um, that a lot of jib eh, not even a lot of jib operators but there are a lot of people in the industry that are that are technicians but not business owners um, I just happen to be a business owner and we all sort of are as freelancers we're our own business, if you will, um, but, but being a crane owner operator is a little different, and here's why. Um, when I bought my first jib, it was easy. I could keep it in my garage. Um, when I bought my second jib, uh, it was actually a triangle, which was a little bigger, so I bought a trailer for it. Well, now I have a trailer and a jib in the, my garage, so then I would park my trailer in my driveway with a jib in the garage. Well, that was okay and manageable for a while, but then I bought my Pegasus, 
which meant I had to buy a bigger trailer for the Pegasus to go in. And now the Pegasus trailer was too big to keep at my house, so I had to buy a, a rent a parking stall at a truck yard. Well, that also led into, hey, you know what? I have a Pegasus now. I have a substantial investment in that. I have to have some business insurance. Um, that business insurance grew and grew and grew. The policy had to grow with the, the bigger cranes and the more investment that I had. Uh, then when I bought the Techno Crane, um, that had to go into a bigger trailer. I had to rent a storage uh, a, a warehouse. Well, the warehouse that I was renting didn't have a big enough roll-up door, so my Techno Crane had to stay outside. I didn't want that to happen too much longer. So then I had to research another facility to where I could get all of my vehicles and my, my trailers inside. Well, this is all the aspects of running a company that I wasn't, I didn't really get into this to have a company. I got into it because it's cool. I'm a jib operator, right? Um, but you have to, if you're gonna grow your company, you have to be a businessman uh, or a woman. And so there's doing your own taxes uh, with an accountant's help, thank God. Um, there's the insurance, there's the facility, PG&E you have to pay, um, your deductions for uh, income and, and uh, expenses, it leads you into a whole other thing. And if you're not a good business person, no matter how good of a jib operator you are, your business will fail because you're not a good business person. Luckily, I've had some great mentors and I was able and, and I'm still able to weather the storm of, of the really bad years and, and, and enjoy the fruits of my labor in the very good years. But it's because I've learned to be a good businessman as well as a good jib operator and crane technician. So my suggestion to people who want to think about maybe doing jib specifically, being a jib operator, is learn your craft. It's like anything else. Um, not only in this industry, if you're going to build houses, you need to learn how to do finish work. Um, in this industry, if you want to be a jib operator, you have to start out as a technician. You have to learn how to build it. You can't just walk in and put your hands on the jib and start running the joystick and call yourself a jib operator. And there are plenty of people who have done that. It's very short-sighted short because in the long run, it only does them harm. So learn your craft. When I first bought my jib, I set it up in my backyard. I put pylons in the backyard and I tried to keep them in frame. I started out really wide and I went left and right and I tried to keep it in center. And then I would go up and down and try to keep it in center. And then as I got a little bit better, I would push in a little bit on the lens to go a little tighter. Because as jib operators, we all know that the tighter you get, the more, uh, the more accurate you have to be. So learn your craft, set up the jib, try to find somebody like me in your market who owns a few jibs and is looking to take on someone to be a jib technician. Um, go out, offer yourself up for, for nothing. I had to do that on multiple jobs. I went out with my jib when I first got it on multiple jobs for nothing um, because I wanted to help DPs and I wanted to show them that this tool was a viable tool for them to use. So go to a shop that has multiple jibs. Learn how to set it up. When it's set up, then run it around a little bit. Try to get a feel for what's comfortable for you, what hand you want your joystick in, what hand you want your zoom and your focus in. Um, learn how to do it. If you're lucky, you'll meet up with a guy who needs you on a job. This happened on Super Bowl last year. I had a guy that I was working with as a technician. I had three jibs on the job. We had two in each studio and one out on the lawn for some exterior stuff. Well, there were times when both sets had to be running at the same time. My jib technician had rarely run a jib, but because we were both shooting at the same time, he got to operate on a show for Super Bowl as a jib technician because he was there at the right time. So if you get hooked up with a guy and you go out, I always used to let my jib techs when on a downtime, put your hands on, stick time, get on it, figure it out, try to figure out how it works. And if the guy is cool, he'll let you take a jib or have you come to his shop, hook it up, play with it, set it, set it up, tear it down, set it up, tear it down, and you'll get that experience there. 
You need to put the work in. It's like any other thing. You can't go out and call yourself a gaffer because you can put a light on a stand and turn it on. You have to know how to carve that light. You have to know how to work with the grips. You have to know how to work with camera, with the ASA. All of that stuff needs to be known. So as a jib operator, you need to know stuff about everything. So put in the work, put in the time, and eventually you'll be a jib operator. Thanks for watching. See you again next time. Wherever you go, they will follow you. The new Freedent My Bag. And you thought it was just chewing gum.